Okay, cool. We are online. How's it, guys? It's MJ, the student tech tree. And what I'm going to be doing in these videos is just going through finance. Um, I haven't prepared for these videos. This is me actually studying at the moment. So what I'm doing is I'm going through um, subject F105, which is also known as the specialist finance subject. And I'm doing this in preparation for the fellowship in finance. So what I need to do is I need to go through the entire syllabus. And the very first thing that the syllabus asks is it says, state what is meant by a risk-free rate of return. Now, when you go into the notes, I mean, you can get a very nice definition that the risk-free rate of return is, uh, well, can be defined at, as the rate at which money can be um, borrowed or lent um, lent at when there is no credit risk so that the money is certain to be repaid. So if we have to just write this out, the risk-free rate of return is the rate at which money can be borrowed or lent when repayment is certain, i.e. no risk. And I mean, that should be no surprise to you because, I mean, the very name of the concept is risk-free rate of return. Now, it's a little bit problematic because this is the very first thing in the syllabus and I have a problem with it because I don't think that the risk-free rate of return is something that actually exists. I think it's, it's hypothetical and this is quite problematic because a lot of the course builds up on this risk-free rate of return. It's one of the, the core concepts and it doesn't exist. So what I mean by the fact that it doesn't exist is because of this word here, certain. Repayment is certain. And also, what do we mean by saying that there is no risk? Traditionally, we see um, government lending as risk-free because the government can always go and uh, print more money. So government lends you, uh, you know, you lend your money to the government, government spends it, if they cannot repay it, then they can always either, you know, raise taxes or they can just print more money. The problem, though, is raising taxes can cause a little bit of political unrest. The people can get angry. Um, the people might refuse to pay or there might be frictional costs in taking up the taxes. So it's not as easily said as done. And also, when it comes to, say, printing more money... Well, there's two problems. What happens if you're using a shared currency, such as the euro? We've seen this with Greece. Or, more importantly, with even currencies that have their, their own, well, countries that have their own currency, what happens is, if you print more, then, I mean, it's kind of like supply and demand, and the currency value decreases. And that is a risk. That, that's a risk that your, the real value of your investment has gone down. So, for instance, if you had to lend a hundred, uh, hundred rand to the South African government, and the South African government cannot afford to pay it, so what they go and do, and they, they print lots and lots of money, and they're able to give you back your hundred rand back. However, because there's so much more money that has been printed, your hundred rand can no longer buy you as many goods and services as it could before. So hold on, let me maybe, let me write this out. So today, okay, let's pretend today, a hundred rand can get you five cokes. Okay, and what you decide to do is you decide to lend that hundred rand to the government. Okay. And let's say the government, um, can't or you know wants to default but instead they they print a whole bunch of money and they pay you back your 100 rand so government then pays you back your 100 rand uh, tomorrow but by doing so 
they have by doing so they have released more more money into the system supply and demand there's more supply of money um, which means that the price then comes down so which means your hundred rands tomorrow can only buy you say four cokes and this is a little bit problematic because you can see that the purchasing power of the currency decreases when the government prints more of it. And that is a risk because if I'm lending 100 Rand, I'm forgoing the five Cokes. And when I get my 100 Rand back, there's only four Cokes. So there is that risk. And this is why we have, or why we charge interest rates. We say to the government, we will only give you a 100 Rand if you give us back 100 Rand plus an amount. Okay, this amount being interest. This amount can be 10 Rand, this amount can be 20 Rand, and the higher the amount should correspond to the higher of the risk taken. So if there's a chance that the government is just going to repay um, the amount using their own money, and it will be five Cokes, you know, if that's, that's a high chance, then the amount will be quite low. But if there's a chance that they're going to print lots of money, and then I can only buy four Cokes, well, then I'm going to need a substantially more amount to compensate myself for that risk. And that's the thing, is that there is always risk. And the problem is, when we look at this risk-free rate of return, the textbook, or, or what the notes are referring to, is a closed economy. And again, this is rubbish, because the closed economy doesn't really exist today. You know, we've got globalization, we've got all these foreign investors who are, you know, pushing money into a country, but then they can pull the money out of the country, and, you know, this can fluctuate the prices and introduce a lot of volatility. And when we have volatility, we have risk. Now, so that, that's my first point. My first point is that the risk-free rate of return does not exist, okay? So, point one it doesn't exist. And point two is if it did exist, its value should be, well, yeah, what should its value be? Okay, should the value maybe be zero? Because think about it, if there's no risk, why should you be getting a reward? Um, you know, that comes down to the whole, one of the, you know, the things in finance is the greater the risk, the greater the reward. Well, if there's no risk, then how can there be a reward? So maybe the value should be zero. Because this, this now gets very confusing. I mean, like I said, I haven't prepared for this video, so I'm still trying to think this whole thing through. Because then what, what is the value of money? You know, it comes down to that very first subject we study in actual science, you know, the time value of money. And we always saw that, you know, you'd rather have 10 Rand today than 10 Rand tomorrow because of the uncertainty that maybe you don't get that 10 Rand tomorrow. So the question, though, it comes down to is what, what would you be indifferent about? So let's say, let me maybe find some more space. Today, you could either have 10 Rand or tomorrow, you know, what amount should you have? You know, if it, was, if it was 10 Rand, then you would choose today. If it was 100 Rand tomorrow, you would choose tomorrow. But what value in between 10 and, say, 100 Rand do you become indifferent about it? And I think that is the only way to determine what this risk-free rate of return value should be. The problem comes is that it's different for, for everyone. So, for instance, if I had to go and I had to say to people, um, you know, who would do the following deal? And let's go 12 rent. Um, you know, who would do this following deal here? You go to a whole bunch of varsity students and you, you ask them this question. You might find that um, like almost, let's say 99% choose today uh, when it's 10 rand versus 10 rand. When it's 10 Rand versus 11 Rand, you might find only 80% choose it. When it's 10 Rand to 12 Rand, you know, we might only find, say, 75% of people uh, choose that one over the other one. And, and this is the thing, is that it's very much 
subjective. For instance, if you're someone who has a lot of money, then waiting tomorrow to get more money is the more logical thing to do. But if you're somebody who desperately needs money now, well then you're rather going to choose the money today, even if the amount tomorrow is greater. So it all comes down to it's subjective and it's the demand for money. Now you might think, oh, everybody's got the same demand for money, you know, everybody likes money. But I would disagree. I would say some people want money more than others. Say, for instance, um, you've got rent to be paid uh, the next day and you don't have any money. Then your demand for money is going to be much higher than, say, a multimillionaire who's got unlimited funds. You know, and you're going to be doing, you're going to be prepared to do a much more uh, labor intensive job or a much uglier job in order to get that a thousand rand to pay your rent than what the multimillionaire would do. So one thing we can see with the demand of money is that the more money we have, the less we demand it. Although not always, because, you know, there's that thing known as greed. And this gets a little bit shaky because now we're moving away from pure finance and we're entering the realm of behavioral finance. And when we enter behavioral finance, we get really, really confused because in order to work up behavioral finance is you need data, you need to do experiments, you need to look at you know, the various observations. And the problem with that type of stuff is that there hasn't been enough done. Or the scientific experiments are very, very small, you know, the sample stats um, are, you know, you can't really draw significant results from it yet. So it's still early days, but we're seeing behavioral finance is a big portion um, to, to say the theoretical finance, which means that there definitely is going to be, I can never spell this word, psychology, Psycho I know there's like a Y somewhere, psychological, I don't know, did I spell that correctly? There's, you know, but there's definitely a psychological element to finance when it comes to say the demand and stuff like that. And that's why when we say the risk-free rate of return, you know, what what should it be, it, it very much is, well, we don't know. And this gets a little bit problematic. I mean, how can we, we not know what the interest rate should be if there's no risk return? Uh, you know, what, what do we do? Fortunately for us, well, some people might say it fortunately, other people might say this is a little bit scary, but the central bank sets the interest rate. So the central bank, which is uh, an in, well, a party that we're, or an organization that we're going to look at maybe in some other later videos, the central bank sets the interest rate. Okay. And this interest rate that they set is supposed to have a bit of the risk-free component and a risk component. But the weird thing is, is that the central bank can set this interest rate to be anything that they want to be. I mean, we, we're seeing in, in Europe and, and Japan and, and some of those countries that the interest rate is becoming negative. Okay, so they're setting the interest rate as negative. And that's absolutely mind boggling because it means that it's almost like saying to someone, would you rather have, say, nine rent, oh, sorry, would you rather have 11 rand today or 10 rand tomorrow. You know, that, that's, almost, that's almost one where we'd expect, say, 100% of people to choose 11 rand today rather than 10 rand tomorrow. But a negative interest rate kind of puts that situation um, on the table, which you'd think, okay, nobody would then lend at a, at a negative interest rate. But, and this is where we're going to get later on into finance, is you have this thing called regulation. And regulation sets a bunch of rules for investing. And you have to invest, if you're a big organization like a pension scheme, a certain uh, proportion, say around 60%, of your assets into government bonds. And government bonds might have a negative interest rate, which means you're investing and you're taking a loss upfront. 
So you're lending money to them. There's a chance that they may not pay it back. There's a chance that the, the currency might devalue. And you're still, on top of all of that, getting hit with a negative interest rate. It's almost like taxing someone for having money. It's like almost like you're a capital a capital tax. And there's no way that you can not invest in this because of the regulations. So this is where finance starts setting up these rules and or the regulators set up these things with really great intentions, but they can have terrible consequences. And and so yeah, this comes back to this whole interest rate. I mean the interest rate it's a really weird concept, and I find it really strange that it is point number one on the syllabus is explain what is meant by the risk-free rate. And I think, I mean, the notes have kind of just got one page on this. You know, they do mention the printing more and the currency risk. But I think what they just want you to understand for the exam is that it's a rate at which money can be borrowed or lent when the repayment is certain. You know, there's no risk, there's no risk of default and all those type of stuff. But it's really unfortunate because, like I've just shown, is that it is very hypothetical and this risk-free rate of return does not exist. And what's also a little bit scary is, well, interest rates are kind of, um, I, guess, I guess you could say this, they're, they're made up. Okay? Interest rates are made up. They're, look, they're made up with, they're not just you know, thumb sucked. The central bank does put a little bit of thought behind it. They do think about how it's going to affect inflation and you know what it can do for price stability in the economy and, and all that type of stuff. You know, they want it growth to be controlled and all that type of stuff. So they definitely there's a lot of thought that is put into what the interest rate should be. But at the end of the day, it's it's made up. It's not a a natural rate. Okay. It's not it's not natural in the sense that say the the speed of light or the force of mortality this you know where we can actually see it observed in nature you know people dying at a certain rate type of thing like that you know mortality rates so mortality rates are are natural but interest rates i mean the way i'm thinking now are kind of like they're made up but look i'm still very much just starting out studying for the subject my opinion might change uh, like I said, I hadn't prepared for this video. This is me just talking out loud. Uh, let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below about this risk-free rate of return. Um, I definitely know that there's a lot more to be thought about around here. And it's something I'm going to touch on when I study some of the later courses. But there we go. Thanks so much for watching. I'm just recording all of this on my tablet using a screen.